First impressions are often not the best impressions, mostly because impressions involve judgment of some sort. And nobody likes to be judged. No one wants to be deemed lacking. As one day role models, we're only gonna see these girls for somewhere between four and eight hours. As one day role models, we're, we are gonna be judged by the girls we inter interact with. And so our goal is the leadership of the event our goal for you and SWE is that you leave the best impression possible of the best parts of being a female in engineering and technology. So Deborah's gonna lead us through a quick primer on bias, in particular gender bias, including a little touching on stereotypes and sexism. And then she's gonna share some micro affirmations to help us combat any bias that we might see moving forward. I'll then talk in a little more detail on why role models are so important and what makes a good one. And then Carrie's gonna pick up with advice on how to work with groups of girls doing engineering and technology activities. And she'll close with a very brief discussion of the Invent It, Build It activities. And it's gonna be brief because the plan is really to cover those activities in glorious detail only during the last 30 minutes of the on-site session on Friday from 2 to 2.30. And then finally, if we have time, we'll entertain a couple questions. As uh, Janelle told you, just send those in via chat <clears throat> um, or you can send it to any of us via email. Um, and, and if we don't get to your questions, we will answer them. We will write responses and we'll make sure everybody gets them. Good snapshot of who's on the call. So now Deborah's going to ground us in how and why we're still so few and steps we can change, take to change that. Thank you, Mary. To get a basic understanding of the cultural influences over us, of why middle school girls are not um, or straying away from STEM careers. Let's go back um, to the starts of the middle centuries to, to better understand that. Um, we will do that by, uh, uh, as, a, as a good start. So over the last century, women have made tremendous gains in non-traditional careers like business, law, and technology. Today, you'll see high school girls are outperforming boys in both math and science, but fewer than 14% of those high school girls will choose STEM as their first choice career option. And how young women assess themselves and see themselves as being successful in those careers is a key part of the equation called self-efficacy. So the purpose of this section is provide the background of the social research on the con cultural conditioning of those gender norms, unravel how we view successful women and women in stereotypically male careers like engineering, and offer those tips and ideas to interrupt our own biases and those of the girls in your workshops. With this awareness of the social research, it's all our goal to help you reinforce a girl's self-efficacy, to reward and encourage participation and make the young woman feel like they fit in. So let's um, go back now uh, to the starts of the middle century to understand those effects. We can see as early as the 1600s that witch trials had a definite toll on silencing women who were stepping out of traditional roles. This form of hostile sexism kept women from power and from speaking their minds. It's been less than 100 years since women have gained the right to vote. I mean, that was back in the 1920s. Uh, and, and today, uh, society has put mechanisms in place to limit hostile sexism. You'll see um, items like Title IX that was introduced in 1972, but that doesn't mean that hostile sexism has necessarily gone away. Rather, sexism has moved uh, a little bit underground. One specific example of that is through the, the, the current events with Harvey Weinstein and the, uh, as a Hollywood producer. In this case, uh, sexual harassment was not only tolerated within his company, but throughout the entire industry. 
today, we also see a, another form of sexism where women are put on a very narrow pedestal and conditioned to stay there with very restricted uh, ways in how they perform their gender. gender. This benevolent sexism uh, reinforces society ordained gender roles. Uh, femininity through the media is seen as beauty, motherhood, nurturing, and uh, the avoidance of conflict. And when women step beyond these stereotypes, they receive pushback. And this is a form of benevolent sexism. And this pushback is uh, received from both men and from women. And sometimes that pushback can even come stronger from women. These attitudes of this pushback can have an unnerving effect that erodes our confidence, where women may be seen as capable of getting the job done, but not particularly liked. Uh, we've seen this research through the Why So Few Women in STEM that was, uh, the research came out back in 2010. And we've also seen it through the Sheryl Sandberg's uh, books and website on Lead In. So this dichotomy definitely undermines a woman's self-efficacy on how they see themselves as being successful in certain careers. And it's the second generation bias um, that uh, Cheryl Sandberg and the Why So Few talk about is how people with the best of intentions can unconsciously undermine women uh, through the second generation bias. To, to understand the effects of this second generation bias, I want to conduct a small test. So let's look at this photo back in 1876 of the MIT engineering faculty. The question is, what role does the woman in the photo hold? Now, as you look at her, Many people see her as holding some type of a support role. She's either an administrator or a secretary. The reality is that she is an engineer and any response other than engineer for looking at the engineering faculty is a stereotype reflecting our views of what acceptable gender roles are. Uh, in fact, this is Ellen Swallow, who was a chemist, and she was the first chemical engineer to, dis, um, to implement uh, water quality standards. And she helped uh, create the AAUW, which welcomed more women into the university setting. All right, you might be saying, well, maybe that wasn't a fair test. I mean, after all, that was over 100 years ago. What about today? All right, so let's look at another test. Let's say that you're working on a project and you need to get some more information on a valve that isn't contained in the valve spec. So you call up the supplier and a woman answers the phone. So the question is, do you hesitate? Do you ask to be transferred to the technical department to get your answer? Or do you dive straight in to your technical question and ask her that question? The fact is that we grew up in a culture that associates males with STEM. Uh, and by characterizing, characterizing a trait or a skill with only one part of the population is a stereotype. And these stereotypes, whether you believe them, believe in these stereotypes or not, can have a tremendous impact on how we view success. For it's not what you personally believe, but it's what you think other people believe that can impact our confidence. So let's look at these uh, traditional gender roles a little bit further to see what those impacts are on confidence. When middle school girls were asked to define the skill sets of a leader, they used terms like nurturing, caring, and good listeners. These are communal skill sets that are traditionally affiliated with women. Yet 
in a separate survey, when managers were asked to define good leadership traits, they predominantly defined them as terms of agency, being direct, self-confident, and assertive. These are characteristics traditionally affiliated with the male. Um, so this social construct of how we define a good leader is what I like to call the curse of the good girl. For girls, internalized beliefs about femininity that runs contrary to what the industry belief is for a successful leader. These gender stereotypes are pervasive and they have an impact on all aspects of women's and men's behaviors. It influences how women are perceived or they view themselves in situations where leadership is required. To be successful, you need to be able to take the lead to get the right assignments and get your viewpoints heard. Agency is to be independent, assertive, and competent. Boys learn very early to be more aggressive and task-oriented to get those things done, where communal is seen as being friendly, unselfish, and expressive. And girls were in, inhibit their aggression and uh, hold back within group dynamics. We've seen that women can be very successful in all types of businesses, but when they assert, when they step outside of that traditional gender norm, they receive pushback to behave in a more feminine way. Um, and these outdated stereotypes on gender roles can play havoc on a girl's confidence. They have a very narrow role where they as, are seen as either too quiet um, and too humble, they're not strong enough to get the job done, or, or when they do assert, they're seen as being too pushy or maybe even too, posse, too bossy. So it's these outdated stereotypes that play havoc on confidence. So let's look a little bit deeper into the confidence of girls in the uh, school realm. The, a recent study through ROCKS um, this year that came out this year did a survey of over a thousand elementary, middle school and high school girls. Um, and what they found is that confidence of these girls will decline by over 25% as girls get older. And the confidence of girls decline as their desire to change appearance increases. So confidence is definitely about the willingness to speak up, to speak their minds, to believe that they are smart and that they want to lead. When girls receive the pushback for stepping outside of these traditional norms, they are frequently fearful of being labeled as bossy or all, all that. And the impact of that hold back of holding back can be seen in real world, real world applications. Women do not advance to the executive suites of the organizations. They represent mere fractions of top political industry and academic roles. And the rules of the game are confusing and conflicting for women who step outside of traditional roles. They, um, and those traditional roles could be either leadership roles or women who step into STEM careers. Through these next slides, I hope to take the awareness of this cultural conditioning that women face and to help you understand how you can intervene. Now, as you work through the girls, through the workshops, you'll have, you'll likely see uh, quite a few elements of the cultural influences of these second generation biases. You'll see them materialized in all sorts of ways. 
you need to be aware of the societal pulls towards these gender norms of women being communal and shying away from agency to get the job done. Uh, so these workshops will give you the opportunity to intervene to help nudge the girls towards agency. Some of the challenges that you might see evolve around broad areas of uh, priority setting and projects, around leading and team dynamics, the challenges or the mindset of their willingness to participate, and when they communicate their willingness to show confidence and own their own ideas. The next few slides uh, will propose a few scenarios of the behaviors triggered by the second generation bias and offer you the tips that you can use to help nudge those girls towards a successful workshop. So first off, let's come across our first scenario. I want you to think about in all of these scenarios, what is the question that you would ask to bring to their attention the issue at hand? In this particular case, you see a team is working on making the project pretty very early in the process. Your fear is that they may not finish it. What would you do? What question would you ask to help get them into the right mindset? Well, one thought um, in this case is to ask, is the project working yet? Here, we're trying to de-emphasize the societal pools to make the external appearance of their project pretty. Our goal here is to provide positive reinforcement to get the job done. It is function first, and then you can focus on appearance. So we want to make sure that the girls are aware of the time limits and that um, we need to make sure that that project works first um, so that it could um, be successful in the end. For the next scenario, you might hear um, a girl's doubt, uh, self-confidence and their doubt about who they are and the purpose of the project and how they don't fit in. In this case, we want to de-emphasize how smart a girl is seen or the smartness. It is not how smart the girl is or how smart others are. So do not compare the girls to others and do not say, oh, me too. Math was hard when I was doing it. Um, you don't wanna say that I know you can succeed. What we want to do is praise how hard the girl is working, how she is trying different approaches or trying different designs to complete the activity. This is all part of the engineering design process, and it's through effort that they're going to learn, and it's through trial and error that they're going to get the job done. In this next scenario, um, you may not see this pop up as frequently as in a mixed gender group, but you might see a little bit of it from the Shire folks where they're not willing to step up and they're only playing a support role. In this case, we want to de-emphasize de uh, the fact that they're always following and not necessarily taking on a key role. Here, um, you want to help the girls understand that they need to try different roles and it'll be expected that they will take on different roles. We want to help them identify and value their internal strengths and their characteristics. And we want to highlight what they've already accomplished. So it's through the efforts that they've done, help them focus in those areas. For this, this next um, intervention, we are looking at communication styles. Frequently, you'll hear uh, girls de-emphasize or downplay their ideas. Um, for fear of being seen too bossy. You'll hear permission words. Uh, they might raise um, an upward inflection at the end of a sentence to, to downplay their thoughts or ideas. So the question is, what would you ask or say to help interrupt this? 
one way of doing that is to to let them know that it doesn't sound like they're sure of their question. We want to stop the tendency of girls diluting their messages with the words that weaken them. Our goal is to help girls realize that their contributions are equal to the insights of others. We want to offer them with small nudges or tips that can give them insights of how to add clarity and belief in their confidence that they believe that they should try this new ideas. So help them rephrase it into a phrase that they can own it, that they're confident that they want to put forward to try this idea out. It is small changes that can spark a big difference on the um, impact of their words. But through this all, we have heard uh, a lot of tips of what we can do to help them become um, more agentic and get their ideas heard. But one of the fundamental fears is still around the idea of them being bossy. And so this very last tip is really important uh, that we help them interrupt this one stereotype with a little micro affirmation on how to value assertive women. When you hear them talk about appearance or how they are afraid of speaking up, help them reframe bossy very similar to what Amy Poehler has done in the Smart Girls series. By, by doing this, you interrupt the cycle of how society views strong and assertive women. By interrupting the stereotype and unconscious bias, uh, these micro affirmations have the biggest impact. So you can help them with their own bossy comeback if somebody is labeled as bossy or their fear of bossy, you can say that, well, if by bossy, do you mean that she can get things done? Well, then thank you. That's a, it's, it's a great idea. We will be a little more bossy to do that. Um, you can help the girls with these other micro affirmations to help vouch for others' credibility so that they don't have to introduce themselves or when an idea is not heard to help amplify those ideas so that everyone can hear them. So it's really good to reflect on these bossy differences and gender attitudes. And one way of doing that, if, um, if you see a girl hedging, is to ask that, well, if a boy were to do the exact same thing, would you feel the same way? And it's a really good way of countering how we hold back is one of the gender uh, cultural differences that we can step through. So with these behavior-based tips, we're hoping that you have a really good start to understand your own biases and how you can add value for women of agency to help get things done and to help step through and prime the situation to have a really successful workshop. And with that, I'd like to turn this back over to Mary, who's going to walk you through how this applies to you during the Invent It Build It. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks a lot. So role models, um, and by the way, when you are a bossy as a young girl, oftentimes you get labeled as the other B word when you go into the working environment. So not always a bad thing, but it happens. The role models are really what I refer to as episodic mentors. They have a briefer, more intermittent, often only a one-time period of exposure to those they're mentoring, unlike what we, more traditionally think of as mentors who are there for longer periods of time. They don't have the luxury of building a relationship over time. And so first impressions can be very lasting impressions, especially with 10 to 15 year old girls. And that can be both good and bad. So your job 
at Invented Build It. And any other opportunity that you have to work with K through 12 girls is to share with them what drew you to engineering and technology. Maybe you're really good at math and that's okay to talk about that. Maybe you're, you know, so-so and you don't want to talk about that aspect, but you you love the fact of working with processes and how uh, doing things in a very logical fashion. So there's a myriad of ways that we help solve the problems while making a good living as an engineer or a technologist. And whether you're still in school or you're working, you need to share your excitement when you went to your the first first championship in Houston or your relief at passing an important test or even some of the places you visited when you've been working. During Invent It, Build It, um, prior to the first activity and just after the welcome, you're going to have an opportunity to share a little bit about yourself with the eight girls at, at each table. The girls are going to draw some questions and then they're going to ask you the questions. They're going to pepper you with questions and, and we will send out a sample of those questions. It will also be on your folder on your table uh, so that you can look at it in advance and be aware of the kinds of things that they might ask you about and be prepared. Be ready to talk about those things so that you can share more of your story and who you are. But the bottom line is that girls cannot be what they can't see. And sometimes what they see is what the media represents. So if they see a geeky, uh, nerdly looking guy with duct tape in the middle of his glasses, um, that's going to turn them off. And at the same time, it, they may be turned off by somebody who is ultra feminine because that person doesn't look like them. They want real people, authentic people, people like us. They just recently did a study and they found that college women who were doing very well in, in um, understanding what was going on with the psychology of people, they actually believe that uh, the image of engineer is even more prototypical than the guys do. So it's a, they're applying more bias to the role than currently exists because even if they, about, even though they know that's wrong, everybody else is doing it. And so they kind of go along with the, with the party. You can't be what you can't see. So what's important is to make sure that we get role models out there that look like the people that are participating and they look like you and me. Next. This, um, this next slide is um, from Fermi Labs in Chicago. This has been around for about 35, almost 40 years now, this draw a scientist test. It was developed in 1983. This is from the early 2000s. And what they did is they had kids walk around the lab and they had three particular engineers that they had them meet with. One was a female, one was an African-American, and one was a white male. And then they had them draw pictures of the scientists beforehand and pictures of the scientists after. And so this is a drawing of a girl who drew a male geeky looking dude beforehand and afterwards draws a pretty cool looking um, female. And so, the unfortunate thing about that is that she still was in the minority. So the majority of girls still drew males after that. And what that message sends is we still have a lot of work to do. Next slide. Um, that points to the key attributes of role models as serving three different basic functions. One is psychosocial. That's the things that get us going in the, the social side of interfacing with people. Another one is that we provide some career and vocational function that we, we do try and help them focus on um, what it is that the, that the skills that they have that they may be able to apply or learn how to apply and then role model functioning functions. And if you look at the bold um, characteristics that are listed here, those are the ones that we at the end of um, our invented bill that we look back and we say, how well did we do? So we will ask you, how well do you think you did with active listening and approachability? And were you a good activity guide? What could we have done better to help prepare you for this? 
And then we're going to ask the girls the same thing. What did they think about the role models that they worked with so that we get uh, convergent data that says, hey, we're doing the right thing or we're not. Um, so what what is important and we recognize the importance of recurrent mentoring that we continue to do this all along. However, um, we'll take what we can get. And if we have an opportunity to bring some role models together and affect a change on a large group of girls, then we need to be able to focus on that too and not just worry about develop, developing long-term recurrent relationships, which we agree is the gold standard, but practically it may not happen. So how can we best be the most effective as possible as we move forward? Next slide. We're just gonna quickly talk about Albert ben Bandura, who I've had a crush on for a number of years. I think he's about 90 now, but he developed the concept of social cognitive theory. And what that says is, or cognition theory, it's it, that people don't operate in a vacuum. People have a two-way pull on other people, on their environment, on the behavior of other people. So there is something, as long as you're in any kind of a community, you have to recognize you're not all on your own. You have some impact on other people and other people have impact on you. And he looked even more closely at what happens in terms of gender development, he and a colleague, and they looked at this discovering that role modeling is so critical to help um, individuals or children develop into full actualized adults that have good self-efficacy and that have good agency and that role models are a critical piece of this. So it is a um, important that we recognize any of the baggage that we come into a, an interaction with people. Um, and we recognize that other people have baggage that we're probably going to have to look the other way or try to work with. And so you never can go in and say, this is the ideal situation. There's always opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about ourselves and others. And to that's where the bias awareness initiatives that Deborah spoke of and that we have now included in some of our online training are, are there to help you become more aware of your potential to bias somebody. And bias all by itself is not an issue. The issue is when bias become it impacts somebody's um, ability to earn a living. It impacts their ability to uh, function in society. And that's on the next slide, um, self-awareness, who, who we develop. It, it is a product of nature. We can't, we can't deny that, but it's a bigger product of the environment that we're in. Gender development starts early. It really does start much earlier. Uh, just a quick anecdote. My granddaughter, three or four years old, I said, pick some toys out of this catalog and to, for her and my grandson, who was a little bit older. And so they're circling toys. And there's one that's like a roller coaster, build a roller coaster that my grandson had circled. And I asked her why she didn't circle it, because I knew she liked that kind of stuff. And she said, oh, it's only boys in the picture. They're the only ones that can use it. So it starts early. And we need to be aware that media shapes it a lot. Um, role models really can heavily influence um, a, the occupations that people go into. And that begins early too, because they look at their mothers. They look at what mom does. They look at their teachers who are 85% female. And they say, okay, that's what I'm gonna do because that's what women do. Um, it, it impacts everything. And the thing that's important to remember is gender is not binary. It's that the studies that have been done, it is not one or the other. If you go to the next slide, it's both. You can have both of those characteristics that reside side by side. And, and we've done some analysis on this and we've discovered that we are a special breed. Female engineers in some respects are a special breed because we have had to adapt to a more traditionally male environment. And because of that, when you look at the characteristics that we have or that we have learned in some cases, we have 
high feminine and high masculine. And so, and that's not a bad thing. And that is actually a good thing. It's called psychological androgyny. And what they found is that people that have high masculine and high feminine often are very successful people. And they're also relatively happy people. So it's the ones that are at the extremes, one or the other, high masculine um, and or high feminine, or actually neither, where they're just kind of going along below the, the median level and trying not to just to, to do anything that's going to ruffle anybody's feathers. So I think it's it's an important thing to note that um that these characteristics can reside side by side and this masculine and feminine equate to the agentic or what they called instrumental characteristics and the feminine equates to the expressive or the communal characteristics and as deborah said leadership needs both of them leadership needs both of them okay so i'm going to now hand you off to Carrie. She's going to talk to you a little bit about the specifics for engaging girls. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, Deborah. And hi, everybody. This is Carrie Greenselder, and I hope you're not too overwhelmed yet. They've um, given you a lot of information, and I even remember myself, somebody told me long ago that every day you are a role model to someone, whether you know it or not. Well, Saturday of Inventive Build It, you will be a role model and you will have all eyes on you and you will know it. And I'm going to go through some tips here on how to engage the girls and be the best role model you can be. And so while we're at Inventive Build It, your goal is really to provide those girls with opportunities to develop confidence in their competencies and their abilities. Uh, we all know that girls often learn how to perform well in school by being compliant and following the directions well but they may not learn those effective strategies to build their own sense of confidence and efficacy as they work through these challenges. And we want these girls that Invent It, Build It to, you know, work with both their skills to complete the tasks um, and the projects that we have for them, but we also want them to better their own beliefs and their abilities. And so one of the best things to start with is how to not engage the girls. I'm going to give you the tips on how to engage them, but let's talk about some of those assumptions that kind of tie all of Deborah and Mary's pieces together. Some of those assumptions that we shouldn't be making about teenage girls because they are generalizations based on stereotypes. Um, to, I'm not going to say this right, Chimamanda Adichie, she cautioned us that, quote, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is that not that they are untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story, end quote. So just because you were or you know and you're familiar with the behavior of one teenager, that doesn't mean you can take a broad brush and assume that all teenage females are the same. And so my one tip for you, and this is the easiest one, is to be here now. Uh, I have been uh, involved with Invented Build It um, since the inception here, and one of our first rules is don't be afraid to speak up and say that this is a cell-free phone zone. And so it should be about the girls. It should be what's happening inside the room, not outside the room. I love that I get to turn my phone off for six hours and be engaged at Invented Build It. So when you volunteer, we expect you also to be fully engaged. Put aside the drama, put aside your worries, your to-do list for the day. They'll still be waiting for you at the end of the event. And commit to the girls that we invited to be with us today. So the key elements of your role model introduction, when you sit down at the table, you'll have a little time with your girls. Um, make it personal. Make it fun. Um, I've seen a lot of role models in the past kind of have a note card in their pocket where they, you know, write down some key things that they don't want to forget to talk about with the girls. So think about, you know, even some of those vocabulary words that, that you might want to share with the girls from your own careers and, and your own, you know, jobs or, you know, studies that you have. You know, we like to use the word techno babble, but share some of that information. Maybe bring a picture or two about your job. Um, I'm a water engineer. Water is pretty easy to understand, but can you help the girls, you know, relate to your field? nanotechnology may be a little more difficult, so maybe a picture might help. 
and then talk about in your career how you've worked through challenges and how you relate that back to the engineering design process, which I'll go over here in just a minute. And before I get to the engineering design process, talk first about the inquiry process. So most middle schoolers um, that will be involved with us at Invent It, Build It are familiar um, with the scientific inquiry process. It starts with the question, you know, how does something work? Why does it do what it does? They make a hypothesis. Um, they do some testing of their hypothesis, collect some data. Uh, sometimes they then establish a model or a prototype and, and, you know, kind of work through that cycle to get the question answered. And so what we'll be working with is called the engineering design process, or the EDP. So this is a little bit different. In, in contrast, the, the scientific inquiry process, um, just a bit, and, and it's what we use at the majority of our suite outreach events. And so the two designs in this engineering design process are similar, and they're shown on the screen here. But at first, you know, we want to identify what the problem is we're trying to solve. And then next is that brainstorming of the solutions selecting one of the solutions, building that prototype, and then testing it for functionality or market acceptance might be in your career. And then finally, that repeat or that redesign before finalizing the solutions. Uh, we see a lot with the girls that, you know, they, their first design doesn't necessarily work. So as a role model, you know, encourage them. Um, you know, don't skip the steps or, or even dwell on a particular step, but, but help guide them through the process here. And so, as a role model, think about how maybe you can work through this engineering design process and, and maybe check off, or mentally check off, you know, a, a point in this process that the students are following it and working their way through. Um, one of the life lessons, really, we want the girls to internalize on our Saturday is, you know, whether they become scientists or engineers or not, they can become better problem solvers. And so, awareness of these different steps of this engineering design process helps us not only become better problem solvers, but it helps build resiliency. And so whatever hands-on activity you choose, even if it's beyond Invent It, Build It, think about this engineering design process um, to be used in your work. And so a few more slides here. We're going to talk about engaging um, the girls. Um, you know, first is hands-off. This is the activity for the girls, um, meaning that you're not to just come in and fix the project for them. When you start to put your hands on the project, Mary and I have seen this a lot, they immediately step back and they let you fix it. Um, or even, you know, the girls might start thinking, oh good, they're finally going to make this work for me. That is not what we wanted in Build It, Build It. We want these kids to gain that confidence and persevere to get those projects done. So think about how you can continue to engage those girls, giving that feedback and listen to what Deborah and Mary had said throughout today and make those connections to your own careers and your communities um, throughout those activities. An even harder one here is giving feedback. Um, I hear this a lot that, you know, giving children positive feedback is, is important and, and, you know, some of those simple phrases like good job or well done or I like your picture. You know, the problem with phrases like this, the kids don't really understand what they did well. And so they're too general um, to really be useful. And so, yes, you know, we all like to hear good job, but it's kind of like junk food. You know, tastes good at the moment, doesn't help you really grow or develop, you know, some autonomy. And so one of the most important attitudes that us role models and adults who want to influence these students positively is to think about a growth mindset and then just, you know, promote that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so one of the scientists, social scientists and psychologists, her name is Carol Dweck, um, she's been promoting this concept of growth versus fixed mindset for almost 40 years now. And so what that is is the ability for our brain to grow and change with effort and practice rather than just accepting that you're born with abilities like intelligence or understanding math or, you know, being a good athlete or not, that, you know, practice or effort will never fix it. Well, we all know, and extensive research has been in this area, that students of all ages can be more motivated by, you know, add-on challenges after being told that their, you know, prior success was due to effort rather than intelligence. And so think about, you know, as you're working with these girls, you might offer some comments about their design. Like, I noticed the way you kept turning and, and trying to get that part and get it the way you want it. 
Um, what did you do? And you know, what did you hope would happen when you did that? And so think about the growth, not just their fixed abilities. Some open-ended questions here um, that I'd like to kind of focus on for these last few slides is, is you know, learning the challenging material through open-ended questions. Research has really shown that that better knowledge retention as well as retrieval than just you know rote memorization. So besides showing that you're paying attention to what the girls are doing, ask them open-ended questions about you know maybe how their designs fit or form or function, and it will help these learners um, you know make those bridges between the concepts and the reality. And of course, at first you don't succeed. Let's get these girls to try and try again. Resiliency and perseverance are two traits of successful people. Confidence, even in the face of failure, is a must, and it's more than just keeping a stiff upper lip, although faking it till you make it, it's another proven strategy, right, of, of success. So it's better for these girls to have tried and failed, and we have seen plenty of failures and, and projects that didn't work out, but they learn through this, and they have at least tried. And so use your own academic and even maybe some of your career failures as teachable moments to demonstrate, you know, how you picked yourself back up, dusted yourself off, got back on the horse. As well as when you see the girls taking risks and trying new things, don't hesitate um, to compliment them. And so at the end here, we have some reflection. So we have a couple activities. The seismic shakeup is the first middle school activity that we'll be doing during the morning. And so think about how you can relate that activity back to real life when you're having conversations with these girls. You know, we have some recent hurricanes across the country, um, not quite related to earthquakes, but you know, still results in structural damage. Talk to them about the different types of engineers or technologists that might work with those you know, earthquake proofing structures. And even ask them some questions about you know, what types of buildings might be more susceptible to seismic damage, why that's important. Um, consider, you know, who else does this kind of work in the community and, and you know, I always encourage um, the girls to, you know, who are they going to go home and talk about this project to. And then in the afternoon we'll have a biomechanical project um, called Helping Hand and that can serve as, you know, it's a uh, serve as an assistive tool for physically challenged people. And so again, similar questions, where might these concepts be applied? What types of disciplines and, and you know, careers um, could be related to this activity. And so a couple more slides here. We do have plenty of resources for you. Um, they're right now parked in our teamwork folder and you should have your role model guide. But even within that, we have some tips for you on crowd control. Remember, this is a room full of middle schoolers. Um, and so some communication reminders and you know what to do in the icebreakers and the activities. So I want to make sure everybody reads those. And if there are any questions, I know we're almost to the very top of the hour, but Mary, Deborah, and I, Carrie, happy to answer any questions you have. And it goes without saying, thank you for volunteering your time at Invent It, Build It. We could not pull this activity off without as many volunteers and helpers as we have. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie, for getting us back on track. <laughs> I think back to you, Janelle, correct? Yes. Um, someone asked about, so early on on slide 14, um, why is it problematic to say that you had difficulty with something like math in school? Um, isn't empathizing often helpful? I'd say generally that's true, but what happens is usually they say they don't try math because they hate it. And so if you say, no, I, I get it, I hate it, hated it too, until I discovered, you know, linear algebra, and then everything became all clear. So I think the goal is not to jump on in a me too um, defeatist thing. The, what, where we typically hear this more commonly is from mothers to their daughters mothers allowing their daughters, cutting their daughters slack on math because they too didn't like it. And there, there is uh, some myth that the fact that teachers, uh, elementary level kids, most of them don't like math. And that's why they became elementary school teachers because there was not much math involved. 
So I, I believe that's a myth, but. And I would add to that too, that, you know, think about the bias and, you know, some of the initial stuff that Deborah went through, you know, some of these girls might look to you as, oh, she's a lot like me. And if she doesn't like math, well, then I shouldn't like math either. And so it can really be just one statement like that can turn somebody off to a, you know, a life in, in the STEM field. And so consider and choose your words wisely. <laughs>